words, my husband did, to one of, one of those verses it says, I'm not tossed about or driven by the foe. Instead of I am tossed about and driven by the foe. I'm glad within and without. Not I'm sad within and without because we have something to live for even here on this earth. And you, you may be seated unless you have a birthday this month. And if you have a birthday, you may come on up to the front.
Her name is Vanessa. She is my sister's daughter. Okay. My sister went home to be with Jesus in 2000, and I, I finally, this week, supernaturally, I got to go get her and her coming to stay with me. Oh, Yay. All right. Well, yes, ma'am. Remember um, Brother Larry Dixon and his wife Sandy. Um, I believe he's still in the hospital. Is that right? He's still in ICU. Still in ICU. Um, so, the doctors don't expect him to come. He's not doing very well, so he really needs our prayers. Pastor of Fifth Sydney and Brandon. And his wife, I believe, also has COVID, but she's not as bad off as he is. So. Please remember them. God is in control, and God can fix this. Amen. The devil brought it, but God commended it. Amen. Any other things that you want to make known for tonight? I'd like to have a, a prayer request for my family in general uh, and another uh, member of my family to pass away. So it's two within a week or so. So just keep my family in, in prayer that they may have the peace that only God can give. So thank you, God. My brother has been in the hospital since the 14th of September with Parkinson's and COVID. We need to pray. Yes. Nancy. Um, Daddy had that procedure done a couple weeks ago. He's not doing good. So we just need to really pray for God to intervene. or We want his will in all things. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Remember as many of these as you can remember this morning. Let's all just lift these needs up um, before our Father this morning because He cares. Amen. Amen. Father, we just come before you giving oh. you praise that you are going to inter intercede on the behalf of all of these that are sick and have problems, Lord. You are bigger than their problems, Lord. Yes. We just pray, God, that you would heal those that are sick. Lift them up off of the sick bed, Lord, and show your power to those around. We thank you, God, for your traveling mercies, for protection, for all that you've done for us, Lord. We thank you especially for your son, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for us, for bringing us to salvation, Lord, through your precious blood. Oh, God, we just pray, God, for each need, and we give you all the praise in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, now that we know God is going to answer, we have our ushers.
those emotional roller coaster experiences. One moment I'm grieving over the situation in our country or the situation with my friends and loved ones that are fighting all these battles that they're fighting. I don't know anybody that's not facing some sort of a battle right now. I don't know anybody. And I would go from that place of, of literally grieving and mourning over the suffering that I see everywhere. And I would go to a place of just plain old simple anger. Just disturbed and upset and becoming angry over all of the different things that are going on and all of the different, uh, all the hatred and all the malice and all the separation and the division that's going on in our world today. And then God would take me to a place of, of that peace that only He can bring. Mm -hmm. Knowing. I, I, I've been encouraging you. If you haven't already voted, voted up. I've been encouraging you to go vote. But if you haven't already voted, I'm encouraging you to go vote on Tuesday. Just encouraging you to do that. But I'm reminded that God sets in places of authority those whom He chooses. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. But we should do our part. We should be involved. And I still encourage you to do that. But it brings a great amount of strength to me personally to know that no matter what takes place on Tuesday, my relationship with God is going to be the exact same as it was on Monday yeah, yeah, and the exact same way that it will be on Wednesday. Yeah. And not because of who I am, but because of who He is. Yes. Amen. The Holy Spirit led me to Psalm number 74. Psalm number 74. And as I turned to that psalm and I read that psalm and then reread that psalm and reread that psalm, I kept waiting for the Holy Spirit to give me the kernel, the essence of our message for this morning. I want you to look around at the numbers that are here today and I want you to realize that this church is a miracle, even this morning. Several of my pastor friends have had their attendance, even though they've opened their churches back up, their attendance is so small. Their attendance is so small. And I asked one of my brothers, I said, why do you think the attendance is so small? He said, well, I can tell you, Brother Bill, I can tell you why the attendance is so small in my church. My people are afraid. They're afraid of this pandemic. They're afraid of this responsibility. They're afraid of what may or may not happen to them. They're afraid. So I asked the Holy Spirit, I know what this I know what this psalm is about. I know who wrote this psalm. I know the reason they wrote this psalm. But what is that for Elm Grove? What is that for us on Sunday morning? And the Holy Spirit spoke three words to me. Trust and obey. Yes. Yes. So let's go to the Word of God together. And let's let the Word of God minister to us this morning. Forget that it's coming through your pastor's voice. Forget that it's Sunday morning and it's a sermon. Let the Word of God speak to you today. Let the Holy Spirit, invite the Holy Spirit to illuminate you today, to instruct you today, to inspire you today, to comfort you today. Let the Holy Spirit come and give you what you need from God's Word today. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Oh God, why hast thou cast us off? Forever? 
Why does thine anger smoke against the sheep of thy pastor? Pastor. Remember thy congregation, which thou hast purchased of old, the rod of thy inheritance, which thou hast redeemed, this Mount Zion, wherein thou hast The psalmist here is lamenting the condition of the children of Israel, the spiritual condition, the physical condition, the political condition, the economic condition. He is, he is there in all of these things. And he is voicing that from where he is, where he sits, where he sees, it appears that God has forsaken the enemy, Satan, is trying to take control of every single person he can. He's trying to plant confusion, that fear I talked about. He's trying to plant doubt. And I think he's being very successful right now. Even amongst those that are the faithful. It tells us in the Word of God that in the last days, that if possible, even the elite of God will be deceived. Brother and sister, if ever there was a time that we need to call out to God and make sure that we're walking with God, it's now. Because it, we, we, we talk about it almost every Sunday in this church. One way or the other, we refer to it somewhere, but especially lately, about how we're in the last days. The end times. Well, do you realize, brother and sister, that for you and I, every single day is a part of our end times? Yes. Every single day. Especially for those of us that are a little more mature. One of the visiting children today asked me, he said, Are you older than my daddy? <laughs> It made me feel so good. Because it was one of Paul's kids. And I, I looked him right in the eye and said, I said, honey, <laughs> buddy, I'm older than your daddy's daddy. <laughs> and his eyes just got big. And he just looked. Yeah, that's old for him. For, for him, that's really old. I was so flattered that I was asking if I was older than Paul. <laughs> 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 Woo! That's what? He's five. He's five. <laughs> yeah. The whole world is huge to him, isn't it? Yes. It's all exciting and it's all in his picture. That's wonderful. Yeah. Verse 3. says, Lift up thy feet unto the perpetual desolations, even all that the enemy hath done wickedly in the sanctuary. <laughs> lift your feet up, Lord. Why do you lift up your foot? You lift up your foot to step on something. You lift up your foot to step on something. You lift up your foot to climb on something. You lift up your foot to go somewhere. You have to lift up your foot before you can ever move. He's asking God, won't you move against your enemies? Why is it that, 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 that all of these things are taking place? Why is it that things are coming about? You tell us that our steps are ordered to the Lord. And you tell us that, our, that, 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 that we need to be aware of, of our relationship with you so that, so that when you speak, we can understand, we can discern that it's you. Thy enemies roar in the midst of thy congregations. They set up, for instance, for signs. We, we see more than ever before right now in the history 
of, of, of our country, more and more churches, more and more religions are moving away from the Word of God and they're forming their doctrines to match what the people want and what society is demanding. Think about it. Don't you remember that it was the demands of society that got Jesus crucified? It was society that was standing there saying, away with him, crucify him. It was the mad, it was the mob, it was the mad mob. They were there. The, the, what society wanted was for Jesus to be crucified. In this particular text, this particular psalmist was talking about how Nebuchadnezzar had come in and destroyed everything in Jerusalem. He was talking about how they had come into God's property, into God's country, into God's mountain, and even into God's house, and they had set up their own idols. They had set up their own gods, and they were taking over the house of God. Brother and sister, don't think that the same things don't happen right now. Some of the idols that are being set up in the house of God today are idols of prosperity. Yes. Come on now. Not to mention how we're always so mindful of the idol of, of beauty. Entertainment. Wednesday night we were talking about how, how that God sometimes asks us to just remove certain things from our life. And the things that God would ask us to remove from our life, they're the things that are doing harm to us spiritually. They're the things that are contaminating our faith. They're contaminating our testimony. And he wants us to get rid of them. I reminded the group uh, 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 on Wednesday night how that several times through the years under my ministry, we've, we've got together and we've set a barrel up out in the yard and we brought things that we knew that weren't weren't. Uh, Christ uplifting, they weren't spirit uplifting, and we burned them in that barrel. Yes. We were talking about that place in Ephesus, in the book of Acts, where all of those people who were witches and warlocks, soothsayers, magicians, <coughs> how they had brought all their books after the revival of, of the message of Jesus Christ, they brought all their all their books and all their curious arts, all the and they burned them together. And it, how many pieces? 50,000 50, pieces of silver was the value of what they burned that day to exalt Jesus Christ and declare that they had moved from this place in life to this place in life, a place of faith in Jesus Christ. Not just Jesus Christ as the prophet of Israel, but Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, their Redeemer. Amen. A man was famous, according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees. But now they break down the car work thereof at once with axes and hammers. They have cast fire into, the, into thy sanctuary. They have defiled by casting down the dwelling place of thy name to the ground. I don't care how often you see things tore down. I want to remind you that God is a God of rebuilding. Amen. God is a God of restoration. God is a God of deliverance. God's mercy endureth forever. And as long as we keep coming to Him and we keep moving in His direction, no matter what our past may have somewhere back there in it, if we put that under the blood, no matter what is in that past, we can go forward to the full measure of God's perfect will and be restored. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about restoration. We live in a society that likes restored things. Amen? We do. I like restored things. But I want to talk to you about the, the destination of restoration. When God restores us, it's not necessarily to the place we have decided we need to be. 
You know, sometimes we get to a certain place in our development as a person, our development as a Christian, and we just think, well, this is, this is as good as it gets. No. I've arrived. I've been, I, I, through my life, I've been there a few times where I thought, it, it just can't get any better than this. It just can't get any better than this. I finally made it to where God wants me to be. And I, I, I've even had the Spirit testify to me that I'm in the center of God's will. But you know, the thing about God's will and God's restoration, the center of God's will for today may be different than the center of God's will for yesterday. Or tomorrow. There's only one center of God's will for today. And it's my privilege to seek that. And when things have tarnished me, or dented me, or all but ruined me. God has the ability to bring it back to where it needs to be. I was saying to God just not too many months ago, God, is El Grove ever going to be what it needs to be again? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Elm Grove is exactly what it needs to be today. Amen. And the Holy Spirit said, quit comparing today to yesterday. Just be who you are. Just be Elm Grove today. Yes. Do you realize what a freedom comes when we realize we can, if we're in the center of God's will today, that's all that matters to God. Even if it doesn't look like it did before. I restored an old car one time. And I took it to a car show. And I entered it in the contest. And I looked around at the other cars that were there. And I knew that I had the best car on the lot. I knew that my restoration was better than any other restoration that was there. And so the judges came by. They even took flashlights and magnets and went all over my car. And I thought, boy, they're being thorough. But that's good because I'm pretty thorough myself. And for, for car collectors and people that mess with these old cars, being being honored by your peers, your, your work being honored by your peers, it's, in that field, that's as high as you can get. If you take a car to a car show and you get the best of show, that's, that's the highest that honor can be. For that day and that show, that's the highest it can be. And I knew, I knew my car was head and shoulders above every other car there. So, I was just confidently waiting for them to call my name. Give me my trophy and let me go home justified in all the effort and all the time and all the love that I poured into that old car. The second runner-up was named. It wasn't me, so I said, well, I'm still in the run. First runner-up. Second place. In the I wasn't named, so I'm still in the run. I'm, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm about to bust with pride because I know I'm fixing to get the trophy that I, I wanted. So they called out the, the one for the best car in the show, and it wasn't me. It wasn't me. How could it not be me? I got the best car here. My details are more, more, more specific than anybody here. How could they not? It wasn't the end of the world. But after all the dust had settled and the, the program was over, I went up to the, to, the, to the fellow that was putting the show on, and he's the, he's the head a judge, and I, I said, would you just tell me where my car rated? I didn't even get 
verse, second, or third. How can my car not win? He said, oh, oh. He said, we really liked your car, but we couldn't give you first place. I said, but why? He said, well, there were two things wrong with your car. I said, well, what's wrong with my car? He said, number one, the shade of paint that you painted it with was not a factory shade of paint. You had too much orange tint in that paint. Hmm. Well, and I knew that. I understood that. Because the color that I picked looked better with a some orange in it. It was a red car, but. Did you know how many shades of red there are? It's just so amazing. I said, okay, I can buy that. But she said I had two things wrong. He said, yes, 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 you do. You've got radial tires on a car that's supposed to have bias ply tires. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Close, but no trophy. They picked me to park. I've never been back to their car show again. <laughs> but not for the reasons you think. I just don't have a car anymore. We have an enemy that tries to break us down using any little detail he can break you down with. The enemy tries to remind you of your past. He tries to condemn you with your past. But I want you to know that when Jesus meets you at the altar of salvation and repentance, that Jesus opens the books in heaven and he erases all of your sins. He erases all of your mistakes. He erases all those things as far as the eternal record is concerned. Never to be remembered against you in heaven again. Amen. And that's a liberty that you have. It says here that they break down the car, but they come in and they tear up, they destroy those things that have been dedicated to God. In verse 8, they said in their hearts, let us destroy them together. They have burned up all the synagogues of God in the land. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet. Neither is there among us any that knoweth how long. O oh God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Sometimes I wish God would just fix it. But the problem with me asking God to fix it is the only spectrum of my mind, the only spectrum of my experience is what I know. Where I've walked, what I've experienced. What if I'm asking God to fix it and what he's doing is actually what he wants to be doing? Think about that. That's right. Think about that. If my steps are directed because I'm righteous and because God is taking care of me, then I want to know that regardless of what takes place in the land, my only responsibility is for Bill to be in the center of God's will one day at a time. Amen. Come on, church. One day at a time. And today I believe it's the center of God's will. I believe it's the center of God's will for you to be here and for me to be here. If the steps are directed by God, I believe God wanted us in this place. And God wants to minister to us. And God wants to heal us. And God wants to redeem us. And God wants to renew us. And God wants to restore us. And God wants, to, wants us to be people of joy and faith instead of people of fear and discouragement, of worry and shame. I don't think he sent his son to the cross to suffer what he suffered so that so that we could we we could be redeemed, but 
but that we could still be redeemed in a mess. Amen. Come on now. Amen. Think about it, church. Jesus died to bring you victory, freedom, joy unspeakable and full of glory, Amen. hope, and confidence. The Bible even tells us that God is not the author of confusion. Amen. Come on, church. He says he wants God to draw his hand out of his bosom. He wants God. In verse 12 he says, For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the water. Thou breakest the heads of the Leviathan in, piece, Leviathan in pieces, and gavest him to be meat for the people in having the wilderness. Thou didst cleave the fountain of the flood. Thou dried, thou, thou driedest, they stopped the flood. Remember? Remember? This prophet is looking at, a, he, he, the psalmist, I mean, this psalmist is looking at a Jerusalem. He's looking at Israel that's been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And he's asking God, God, how long are you going to let this go on? When are you going to vindicate yourself, God? When are you going to bring honor to your own name, God? Because everything that's going on in your nation right now doesn't honor you. This is where the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us today and telling us that if we want God to be honored in the land, God has to be honored right here in our heart, in our yes. mind, and with our hands, and with our feet, and with our mouth. Amen. If we want God to be honored, we're the ones that have to be the living, walking, breathing representatives, ambassadors, if you please, of Jesus Christ. Amen. Those of us that have been bought with blood. We have communion prepared. We're going to share in just a few minutes. And a part of communion is reminding us about the blood covenant that was established for you and me on Calvary's cross. That covenant that allows mortals, mortals who were born in sin, to come through the blood and for the blood to remove the sin and for us to be brought into a restored place with God. Amen? Adam and Eve were in a place with God, but they rebelled. They disobeyed. They sinned. And I just want to point this out. Only one sin is mentioned for Adam and Eve to be pushed out of the garden and pushed away from God. Only one sin caused the seed of, of Adam to perpetually be passed on from generation to generation. One sin. Church, we need to stop debating about what is sin and what isn't sin. If the Word of God says it's sin, then it's sin. Amen. I don't care what I think or what I feel or what I want it to be. If the Word of God says lying is a sin, then it's a sin. If the Word of God tells us that it's sin, that it's sin. <laughs> and we need to just say it. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. Yes. We don't have to think about living, giving something up. We don't have to think about changing our lifestyle. We just do it because the Word of God says that that's sinful and we shouldn't do it. Yeah. That it shouldn't be ever named among us. Because there's going to be many, many people, many, many people, now listen to you, church people, they're going to stand before the great white throne judgment. And they're going to say, oh, Jesus, I paid tithe. I even prayed. I even cast out demons. I raised the dead. I was your ambassador. I was your man. I was your favored one. But God is going to say to them, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never do you. Because you did it your way. 
You interpreted my word your way. You warped my word your way. You didn't want to enter into that blood covenant that I gave you. You wanted, you wanted it to be warped to be what you wanted it to mean and what you wanted it to say. Church, can you, can, can, you, can you just hold on for a minute now? A minute longer? Is it okay just a minute longer? There are so many voices in the pulpit today saying that things are not sin, that the Bible says are sin. I don't care how many preachers get up this morning, oh, on the television, on their, on their Facebook page, or, they, or, or, or they're just in their isolated place. If they stand up and say that abortion is not a sin, then they're liars. Come on, church. If they say that homosexuality is not a sin, they're liars. If they say that adultery is not a sin, they're liars. And we have to accept that. Yes, we'll tell you that all these things are sin. I'll tell you they're sin. But I never tell you that they're sin without telling you this too. My God can forgive that sin. My God can cleanse you from that sin. My God can restore you and make you whole to be the person that He wants you to be. That He'll be happy with. The person that will never stand at the great white throne judgment. Come on, church. Verse number 16. The day is thine. The night also is thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. Remember this, that the enemy hath reproached, O Lord, and that the foolish people have blasphemed thy name. We hear people using the name of God in vain now more than ever before. We live in a vulgar, corrupt generation. They think they can say any word they want to say and it's not important. But I remind you that God said He records every idle word. And when those words are sin, then that works against you and that will separate you from God. Watch your words. In one scripture He said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay because anything else just comes to perdition, just comes to failure, comes to sin. Think about it. The enemy is constantly reproaching. One of the tactics that I believe that Satan has been using through this pandemic, and by the way, this pandemic, this disease, this, this thing is from Satan. Amen. And it's an attack on humanity. And I believe the greatest thing that Satan wants to accomplish with it is not the death of people. It's the death of the church. It's the redeemed running afraid and fearful. Brother and sister, I'm not talking about... If you wear your mask and if you social... I don't call that running afraid. I wear my seatbelt when I get in my vehicle as a precaution. I wear this mask as a precaution. I somewhat, somewhat keep my distance. You have to forgive me. Sometimes I just need a hug. I just need a hug. And I know it's selfish of me. The Bible says here that it's foolish people that have blasphemed thy name. Church, don't ever blaspheme God. Don't ever blaspheme God. If something is going so terrible in your life and something is, is so upside down, you better look at the source of where that thing's coming from. Verse 19, O deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove unto the multitude of the wicked. Forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. Have respect unto the covenant. 
Oh, this is shopping time. This is shopping right here. Oh, Father, <laughs> let's remember our covenant. Yeah. Yeah. And see, when we say God remembers something, it's not so that God, because God doesn't forget. We say that so that we remember who we are. Uh, today I want you to remember who you are in Jesus Christ. Today I want you to remember that you're a covenant walking, a covenant talking, a covenant believing, a covenant experience child of God. You are in a blood covenant through Jesus' blood, and that covenant means that God has given you all that he has as you give him all you are. Come on, church. And if God has given you all he is, then there's nothing that can come against you that you cannot prevail, that you cannot endure. And if something comes against you and it happens to take you on the glory, did you notice that I carefully, carefully, carefully called her home going a promotion yeah. when I talked about Ron's mother? Yeah. <laughs> What's the worst the devil can do to me? Uh, think about it. Many, many decades ago, when we were still in the old building, just the one room building, I brought a whole bunch of popsicles to church, <laughs> popsicle sticks to church one day. And we wrote on every one of those that they were devil chasers. Yeah, yeah. Amen? And somewhere in the context of what I've been preaching right there, I had used a, a, a political pun that was put, put out there, you know, Walk softly, but carry a big stick. <laughs> Amen? How many of you know who said that? Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. How many of you were there when he said it? <laughs> 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 we have some people in this room that were alive and well when Teddy Roosevelt said that. Amen? We gave everybody the popsicle stick. And we said... That's the biggest stick you need to put Satan in his place Amen. every day. Amen. Come on, church. Amen. Why? Because of the blood covenant. Because the blood covenant that brings God to you, to live in you, to dwell in you, to habitate in you, and to be a part of everything you are. Yes. Amen. Yes. Yes. And he even gives us the Holy Ghost Amen. to indwell us. So that the Holy Spirit can speak in that supernatural voice of God. When the voices of reasoning and the voice of the clamor and the voice of the right are getting in the way. Let not, oh let not the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and the needy praise thy name. Now, brother and sister, he's not talking about poor financially here, but he could be. What he's talking about here is the state that their nation was in, the state that their synagogues were in, the, the spiritual state of Israel. He was lamenting over that, and he was saying, oh, let the poor and the needy praise the Lord. He didn't tell them to go out and organize an action group. He didn't tell them to start up another political power or political authority. He, he said, what you need to do in this place, the, the, the psalmist tells what we need to do in the middle of all this mess is praise thy name. Praise the name of God. Praise the name of Jesus. Exalt the name of Jesus. And not just in our singing at church. But in our very lives. Yes. The Holy Spirit just spoke again. I'm going to obey. There are some things in your homes that dishonor God. <coughs> and if you're really going to walk in this covenant, you need to get those things out. The Holy Spirit hadn't told me what they are. But you know what? It's better if the Holy Spirit tells you what they are. Yes. And it's better that you trust and obey. And that you get those things out of your home. You get those things out of your life. You might need to go out to the burn barrel and burn them. 
You might need to shred them. You might need to do a lot of things. I'm not, I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm just saying that if we're going to praise the name of the Lord, we need to get some things that, are, that Satan is using against us out of our lives. Come on, church. Arise, O God, and plead thine own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproached thee daily. Forget not the vo voice of thine enemies, the torment of those that rise up against thee, and increase continually. We're hearing more and more and more of these voices in our society that are anti-God and anti-church. Do you realize the miracle that took place when our newest Supreme Court justice was ratified and sworn in? The main attack against this woman was her faith. The church, if they're attacking her faith, they're attacking your faith. But even in the, in the attack, she was still ratified. She was still set in place. I don't know. I guess I'm a little naive, but... I believe that she's the one God wanted there. Ah. She claims to be a righteous person. Her life and the life of her family show that they are righteous people. Years and years ago, one of our members, Tracy Johnson, made a little plaque, put it up on the bulletin board, and said... <coughs> If you were accused, if you were arrested and taken to jail and you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Yeah. It was up on the bulletin board for a long, long time. I've still got it somewhere. It's in all my goodies somewhere. I, I, I don't remember where it is. Brother and sister, the voices against the church are increasing. And you say, oh, Brother Bill, this, that's all that political stuff. <clears throat> no, I'm talking about those voices that talk to you. About, well, I'm not going to go to church today. Or I'm not going to pray today. Or I'm not going to read God's Word. You realize that, that the devil's trying to get you to defeat you any way he can? And if he can get you with the little things, the big things take care of themselves. That's right. And he's got you right where you want. Amen. Come on, church. <clears throat> We can stand in any circumstance, and we can represent God as long as each day we find the center of God's will for that day for my soul, for your soul. Amen. Amen. So today, let's take a moment. And I want you to ask this question. I don't want you to respond. I just want you to ask this question yourself. Is there anything in my life that displeases God? Anything. An attitude. A vocabulary. Music. Entertainment. Habits. Addictions. Is there anything in my life that displeases God? Don't want you to answer. Don't want you to show any sign. This is between you and God. But right now, let's pray. First for ourselves, and then for each other. Father in heaven, we are assembled into your house. And all we see what the psalmist said, how the psalmist was lamenting about the terrible condition of his world, about the terrible condition in the synagogue, and how that the enemy was seeming to prevail, and the foolish people seemed to have the upper hand. And Lord, we come before you today looking at how, looking at how we can make a difference in our world, because the same signs that are all in our generation, they're all in our time, they're all in our world. Those negative voices, those destroyers, the enemy. Father, I want to find the center of your will for my life today. And so I bring myself to you asking you, Lord, is there anything in my life that displeases you, Father? Reveal it to me right now, Lord. 
Bring it into my mind. Bring it into my thoughts, Lord. Bring it into my consciousness, Lord. That, that, that whatever it is, it displeases you. And Lord, whatever it is, when you show it to me, oh, help me, Lord, to have the faith to give it to you today. Help me, Lord, in my weakness and in my failures and in my faults to turn to you to walk within the covenant that you prepared for me. To walk in the joy of the Lord. Forgive us our sin, dear Father. And separate us from those things that you brought into our mind and into our spirit today. Lord, may this very moment be the moment that we enter into the perfect center of your will for today. I claim this victory for myself. I claim it for my flock. And I claim it for every person that will watch this on YouTube or on Facebook. Oh, dear Father, Dear Father, cleanse us today. Wash us fresh and new in the blood. And then send your anointing, dear Father. Send your anointing. And may your peace, may your peace flood our lives. And through us, may it be seen. testifying to the world that we accept the body and the blood of Jesus as our redemption, as our hope, as our promise. And we're identifying and we're actually celebrating. Celebrating his death, celebrating his crucifixion. Yes. Because he was willing to lay down his deity, become a man, live on this earth, and suffer and die without sinning to prove to us it could be done and to show us that the path of righteousness can be walked. Victory can be ours. And he sealed it 
and with his own blood. So now I serve those that have served. For honor, whom honor is due. On the same night that he was betrayed, <laughs> Jesus <coughs> took bread. And he broke that bread. And he said to them, This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. We have that symbol of the bread in our hand. Let us hold it up as we anoint it and as we pray over it. Father, we cannot in our, in our human understanding, we cannot comprehend what Jesus went through to, to, to bring healing to us. All of the terrible things that were done to his body are for our healing and the healing of the nations. Bless now this symbol of the broken body of Jesus as we partake it, as it becomes a part of us, as we, as we let it come into our being. Oh, may the body of Christ be ours, and we celebrate and we thank you in gratitude. In the holy name of Jesus, we thank you, Father. Let us partake. Jesus did what no one else could do. What we couldn't do for ourselves. He became sin for us. All of us. And anybody that will come to repentance, anybody that will come and ask. That word is whosoever. Amen? Amen. Whosoever. We now have the symbol of that blood that seals the covenant. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And God sent Jesus, His only Son, to this world as the Lamb slain for you and I, slain from the foundation of the earth to redeem us from our sin. Father, we hold the symbol of the blood of Jesus in our hand. And we come to you knowing that only this blood can remove our sin. So we plead the blood over our body. We plead the blood over our mind. We plead the blood over our spirit. We plead the blood over our soul. Lord, and as we partake of this symbol today, cleanse us fresh and new. Cleanse us completely and holy as we come before you in repentance, in gratitude, and in joy. Bless now this symbol of the blood of Christ. In the name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let us pretend. So my favorite song for this occasion, What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's stand as we're dismissed from the meeting house today. And let's go forward from this place full of joy, unspeakable, and full of glory, knowing that we're the center of God's perfect will. Amen? Amen. Amen. Brother Scott, will you dismiss the meeting in prayer? Yeah. Father God, thank you for this assembly. And thank you for bringing us together to hear your word. Let us take it into our hearts. Help us to become more like your son Jesus. This week and every week. In Jesus' name we pray this thing. Amen. 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 Amen.